Welcome to the Leader Post Rider Rumblings podcast, episode number 146. Taylor Shire and Daryl Davis are with you once again for another week discussing, it seems like another loss uh, for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. That seems like a topic we've been talking about uh, lots over the past few weeks after such a strong start to the season. Um, Daryl, this one, of course, the 27-24 loss to the Montreal Alouettes last week. And there's a bunch of different things we could talk about. And we're going to talk about them all, but let's start uh, with the kicking game and, and just the, the poor night and poor performance that Brett Lothar had and obviously had a lot of people talking afterwards. Oh, yeah. Isn't that the truth? You know, I I wrote a column about it, uh, how many people are referring to the manure night when Paul McCallum missed 20 years ago, missed an 18-yarder that could have put the riders in the, in the uh, Grey Cup, and all of a sudden uh, Brett Lothar is getting, well, not threats, but just everybody saying, oh, let's we got to – do something just to show how angry they are. Ah, it's only a game, right? Uh, it did. Brett Lother had the worst game of his career. He faced the music. He's apologized to his teammates. He's been a professional about it. Uh, the worrisome thing is uh, missing four out of seven field goals and giving up 18 points, basically 12 field goals. And then one of those was returned 128 yards for a touchdown. That was a deciding factor of the game, obviously. And, and uh, it's not usually very easy for us in the media or the fans to say it's your fault. But in this case, it's solely his fault. They lost the game, but the lost in all of this Taylor is that the riders have played two very solid games against the league's best team, the great cup champions, the Montreal Alouettes, the rough riders were right with them. And, and you know, the, for parts of the game, basically dominated the game and ended up losing it. So what they have to do is become more like the Montreal Alouettes and learn how to finish the game. They they pretty good early in the season. They were finishing and pulling some miracle finishes out. That seems to be the reason why they're not winning now and the reason why you and I are talking about them not having one in four games. Yeah, and uh, as I wrote about after the game, I will credit Brett Lothar again on here for sticking around, waiting for media to come. He handled it like a professional. He, he, Like I said in the column, he waited more than 20 minutes, sat in his stall, had his head down, and then came in and answered every question um, like a professional. And and I think a lot of people, it would have been easy to hide or, or go somewhere else or duck out. He not only waited, but made sure that uh, he was able to answer all the questions. He even was one of the most requested players as the riders returned back to practice on Monday. A lot of people talked to him about you know, bouncing back and, and how do you respond from something like that? Um, again, said the right things. You know, he's, he is a professional. He's been around long enough and, and credit to him for taking it like a man. And, and now he's got to show that he can respond, right? He's, he's saying all the right things after a, a tough night at the office. Now, is that a blip? I, it hasn't been the greatest season for him this year. His, his percentage uh, and field goal percentage is down about, 10 percentage points than than what it has been in his career he's at kicking about 71 percent obviously those misses are are taken into account this year but he knows he has to be better or else as you mentioned there's going to be some competition they'll have to bring in competition um to not only you know challenge him but but push him to be better yeah some players respond to that some don't we'll see how he does they're not this is a short week though once again we watch the riders go through a walk through today they have a close practice this is we're recording this on monday right so we saw their their walk through it was kind of a slow pace and they looked a little groggy to be honest but that's okay it's a hot day and, and they have to they'll revive themselves and they'll have a close practice before they head to toronto for a team to play again third time this season against an Eastern team that is coming off a bye. So it's not really a fair schedule. They're not going to whine about it. But when you look at it, it's not it's not very fair. Uh, the, the the one last thought I have about Brett Lothar, Taylor, and you and I have talked about it, and you, I think you dug up the statistic a while ago, that how many times he's succeeded in those situations, like a game tying, a game winning field goal in the last two, three minutes of a game. He's been perfect, basically, his entire career. This is one that he missed. And that's Despite his low percentages, his 71%, which is the league low at the moment, uh, that's what's always kind of saved him is that they knew they could count on him at the end. And I'm not sure. They say they are, and he'll say he is. But are they sure that he can be counted on at the end of the game now? Because he always was before, but now you have to wonder about that. And that's the last question that you you want you might want to keep in your mind and see if Corey Mace, the head coach, changes strategies because of that. Yeah, I think until it's a trend, 
there's not going to be any any changes being made. It's a blip. I, I would say this last game was a blip in his year, in his career. Until there's a trend of, of downward decline, there's no reason to make a change at kicker. And uh, that sounds like, at least for the time being, until that trend is developed, uh, what they're going to do. Um, the other thing we should talk about, uh, and we talked about it last week a ton on the podcast, was the return of Trevor Harris and, and, and how he looked in his debut. And, and one of the things he talked about in his post-game uh, press conference was how everybody else around Brett could have been better. I mean, the offense, Trevor Harris looked good. They put up a bunch of yards, but they also didn't score a lot of touchdowns. They put Brett in those field goal spots where they should be making those field goals, like you said. But but again, uh, they did find the end zone eventually, but um, they didn't sort of have that killer instinct early on. But Harris did look good in his first game back after missing six games. He did. He got them within range, right? The five missed field goals or the, I'm sorry, the four missed field goals were all inside 50 yards, which so they should be made probably inside 50. But Trevor Harris, to think how well he came back after missing six games, uh, the first quarter was okay, and he kept getting better and better. He started the third quarter, I think, with nine straight completions until Sean Bain dropped one that just yeah. – unbelievable right and you know he, he made a good play to get his hands on it but there's no way a professional athlete should drop that ball and that went the other way for a touchdown after that uh, a controversial touchdown by the way we can discuss the old god center anytime you want but uh so there were some slip-ups here and there but trevor harris isn't one of them he'll say yes they shouldn't have been left kicking seven field goals they should have scored more touchdowns but that's the way it is in the cfl now right it's a, to me it's still the canadian foot canadian field goal league uh, touchdowns are a rarity. Field goals are, are everywhere you look, or at least the temps are. So did they need to finish? Yes, they did. But he threw for, what, 355 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Once again, he, st- <laughs> he still hasn't run the football, Taylor. That's still an amazing stat to me in a, in a league that relies on running quarterbacks. He hasn't carried the – Trevor Harris hasn't carried the football once. Remember a week or two ago, you and I were laughing uh, – he said, well, I can carry the ball if I need if need be. And we both kind of chuckled at that because uh, I don't think they're going to let him. He doesn't want to. He throws the ball so quickly he doesn't have to. But uh, it doesn't hurt to have a running quarterback. And the game he got hurt, he did scamper out of the pocket, right? And then ran for, I don't know if it was the first down, but he ran. But then it got called back due to penalty. Yeah. And then he got hurt. Not, <laughs> yeah. not long after that, he got hurt. So, yeah. um, well, you know, they'll keep him in the pocket. They'll keep him upright. They did a great job of that uh, against the Alouettes. So they'll obviously look to do to do that again this year with probably a new right tackle. Uh, Travion Tate uh, was released from Calgary, requested his release from the Stampeders after playing four games, being a healthy scratch for, for some of those games. He's probably going to slot in at right tackle this week with Logan Furland moving uh, over to right guard. So I, I, I don't have a, a ton of knowledge on, on how Tate has played over his career. I haven't watched him specifically isolated to him, but I think it is a bigger boost to the lineup. Um, because they had Nick Jones before, who was that sort of fifth starting offensive lineman. They actually moved him inside to guard, played Furland out there. So uh, I think getting Furland back to his normal position, having Tate play out there is a big boost to this, uh, this offensive line. 11 offensive linemen have started for the Rough Riders this year. That's more than two complete units. I know most of them are in the same spots, left guard and right tackle, but there's no way you can plan for that much, right? It's just the fact that they're finding guys who are at least competent at the position is really pretty impressive, right? That they they keep throwing these guys in, they they can play, uh, and they're looking for better players all the time, right? They they watch them play and say, you know what, we can be we can improve ourselves at that spot. So they're they're going out, they're recruiting, and they realize, as you said, that it's important to keep Trevor Harris upright. So they're going to make that offensive line as strong as they can. And it hasn't done too badly when you think of all the changes to it. So kudos to them, uh, you know, uh, and and the, the entire offense, actually. I know that A.J. Olette's been hurt. They're probably going to pull him out as, as a running back, put Frankie Hickson back in. But look at the Keyshawn Johnson and look at Dante Myers and how, how well some of those younger guys, have, the new guys, have played. Uh, in the absence of receiving, so they've lost a lot of, they lose Mitch Pickton, it looks like, for quite a while. So they've lost Keon Schaefer Baker, who's probably coming back pretty soon. The Rough Riders have been able, uh, I know it's not, they're not leading the league in the amount of man games lost to injury, but I bet they're leading the league in a in number of man games lost by starters to injury. Mm-hmm. And they've been able to fill those spots pretty well, starting with, as you said, the offensive line. Yeah. The, I don't know. Every year it's always, Everybody always preaches next man up. That that phrase gets used so much this year. Obviously, they're they're having to do that again. And 
And I think that is a Jeremy O'Day does deserve some credit for that because he has these, these people, whether it's free agents or, or guys that are on the practice roster, um, even like Dante Myers, right. To came into training camp, had a good training camp and has now waited nine weeks and then has, has back to back 100 yard games. Um, so being that reliable target to, you know, nobody knew who Dante Myers was last year. And then all of a sudden uh, he's maybe that next starting caliber receiver. Jareth Stearns got bumped out of the starting lineup uh, for a guy like Dante Myers and Keyshawn Johnson, who, like you said, have both been playing well. Um, I didn't want to talk a lot about the command center. We harped on it all last week after that uh, game against the Red Bucks, but the command center came into uh, play in the fourth quarter on a very crucial drive. I don't know. The, the pass interference call that was challenged by Corey Mace. Um, it clearly wasn't pass interference. The guy dove. I don't know how they botched that and, and didn't overturn that. You can make the call in the field, whatever, but you have to be correct when you're the command center. You have to make that right call. And, and we could all see it. Fans could see it. Media could see it. Everybody could see it, that it was not pass interference on Marcus Sales. However, Ruled a pass interference 30 yards, 30 yards down the field. They go, and then a few plays later, Davis Alexander clearly looks to step out of bounds uh, on the touchdown run at the seven-yard line, but after review, it was ruled he stayed in bounds. I, again, I don't know how they got that one wrong, but um, not to harp on it, but I will harp on it because uh, I think those are two pretty egregious errors that were not corrected in that game. Yeah, two horrible errors again, and you can't – have a perfect football game. You can't play it perfectly. You can't officiate it perfectly. So if you're not going to officiate it perfectly, which is a, a pipe dream, then why even bother wasting the time of everybody involved in the game with going to, I call it the God center. And I'm going to continue calling it the God center because they just all of a sudden step in when you don't think they should and mess everything up. So just get rid of them. Uh, I know that they, they tried to backtrack there. It's just obviously not in their, abilities to step back and let the game be decided by the people who are playing it or officiating it. So let's just get rid of it. Those two calls you cited, you're right. That was not pass interference. You're right. The Montreal quarterback was out of bounds. How come they can't see that? If you're not going to be able to see that, then get rid of the command center and let's just move on and let the game, the game go on. I don't know if it would have changed. I, I, as I said, I, I don't care if the riders win or lose. I just want the game to be played properly and they're not being allowed to play properly to, with the command center. So let's, uh, let's let, the, let everybody else decide, the people who are involved with the game decide rather than guys sitting there watching TV monitors. Yeah, I don't. I think that camera angle on TSN of, of showing these guys' backs in the command center. I don't know if it's doing them any favors. It's they're becoming too much of a topic week in and week out, especially for this Rough Riders team that has uh, obviously had. I don't want to say two losses or two victories stolen from them, but uh, the command center has come into play for the last two weeks, and, and I don't like you said. I don't. I would rather them figure out uh, the call on the field. And, and maybe you need an, an extra official, right? Maybe you need to, I don't know, like, I don't know how you want to fix that, but somebody's obviously watching that quarterback step out of bounds or stay in bounds. Like that's one person's job to do that. So let that have the trust in that person to make that call on the field and, and go on with it. Right. And, and if people want to, but the official was right on. down the line, a little ways behind Davis Alexander, the Montreal quarterback and was looking, you could see him, but there was a player in his way, maybe a little bit, how he still couldn't see it is beyond me. And you're right. TSN didn't do anybody any favors. They only showed part of it with his foot in bounds. Didn't show the continuation of the play where it certainly slid onto the white part. I don't know. Just it, wouldn't it be better if a couple of days afterwards we said, Oh, look, that should have been, called out of bounds, and then you can argue about it, rather than saying they've got 25 cameras at the game. I don't know how many cameras they have. And they got to see that in slow motion or as many ways as you want to see it and still couldn't make the darn call right. So why bother? Let's just hurry up the game. The games take way too long now because, oh, the command center has decided it's going to play God, so let's just kind of wait a while. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, we drone on and on about it, Taylor, but it's really it's really ruining the game. And I've heard so many people phone into call in shows now saying it's making the CFL look foolish. Your comment about the watching the command center and those guys sitting there like they're watching TV. It's comical now. It's gotten way past the point of any pertinence, any relevance. So let's let's let the players decide it. I, I, 
whatever happens, happens then. That's the way I like it. You've gone to minor football games. We go watch university games. We watch the Prairie Thunder play or the Regina Thunder play. These games flow along and you say, oh, well, maybe they missed the call, but let's, isn't it fun just being here and not having to wait to cheer for a touchdown, not having to wait to see if it's overruled. Let's just play the games the way that they were intended to be played. Yeah, maybe they missed a call. Maybe they missed a receiver missed a pass, maybe a quarterback missed a throw, maybe a running back missed a hole or a guy missed a block, right? It's yep. going to happen. It's it's football. We, we don't expect the junior officials to be perfect. We don't expect the junior players to be perfect. Same as professional. They're, they're better as professionals, but they're not perfect. Same as officials. Obviously, the officiating standard goes up as you climb the ladder and, and, and you know, from amateur to professional but it's not going to be perfect and the players aren't going to be perfect either. So let's hope this is the last week we have to harp on the command center, but I uh, Touch wood. don't think, I don't think that'll be the case um, because yes, the riders, uh, they do have a short week, as you mentioned, uh, facing the Toronto Argonauts on Thursday, another team coming off a of bye, as you mentioned, and uh, they could have a new quarterback as Chad Kelly has been reinstated <laughs> from his suspension. So thoughts on the matchup. Oh boy, it, it's going to be rough on the on the Rough Riders. Uh, the, these that's a tough schedule. Like we keep saying that, uh, like they lost in Montreal, they tied in Ottawa, and these in the earlier incidents like this. And I don't the schedule makers in the CFL don't pay close enough attention to what they're putting some of the teams through. How unfair it is to teams like the Rough Riders uh, um, for them to be having a walkthrough today, one closed practice tomorrow, and then jumping on an airplane and going to Toronto against a team that hasn't played in two weeks. Totally unfair. Uh, you know, if you're going to have short weeks, make sure the other team has similar night amount of rest. But it, so it's tough. The Argonauts also have, as you say, the the golden boy back in uh, Chad Kelly, who I'm amazed that uh, he's judging by his social media, which I guess is the best thing that you could that we can judge it by. It all he seems is vengeful. He doesn't seem grateful. He doesn't seem remorseful about things that he's done. He I know he had a prepared statement that says he, I've learned to be a better teammate, colleague, and person. Okay, show it. Let, listen, I'm all for second chances, but he's had three or four second chances. Uh, it doesn't seem like he's he's uh, uh, remorseful to the specific person who he harassed. I, I hope she's okay. I hope the people around her are helping her, that she's getting support. Um, and I realize that the Argonauts have not been punished one iota for totally ignoring her issues, her complaints, they're not her issues, her complaints. Her She was in a bad situation told people above her in the organization and nothing was done to the Argonauts. The only person who suffered was Chad Kelly, who should have been punished. And if they think nine games is enough, okay, well, let's, let's move forward and see. He's got a last chance clause in the, in the agreement. He gets one last chance. Okay. Why aren't the Argonauts being punished for this from the CFL? They were, they didn't do things. Mike Pinball Clemens and John Murphy somehow or other were in charge of this franchise and they should have done something about what happened and they didn't and they're still not being punished for it, and that's not right. Yes, very well said. Um, we'll leave all that at that, I guess, and, and focus on the football itself, um, because really Saskatchewan, I don't know how, but somehow in this Wild West, they're still in first place, despite not having won a game in quite some time. Mm -hmm. It's it, it seems like after such a weird start to the season where Winnipeg fell off and Edmonton was obviously winless, BC and Saskatchewan are kind of running away with it. Everything has tightened up now, and it's I would say it's anybody's West, like the, the West division is completely wide open right now. It's anybody's for the taking. It really is, isn't it? Uh, and it's funny, the, I think it's maybe Saskatchewan's defense has played okay, but remember the huge turnovers they were getting early in the season, right at the end of a the game, they would turn the game around for the Rough Riders and it doesn't seem like they're getting those breaks the way they were. Like they Are they breaks? Okay, yeah, they're breaks, but they were earned breaks because they played hard, they were in the right position. They're just not falling the Rough Riders' way the way as they were earlier in the season. So are the Rough Riders a worse team than they were? No, they're not quite as lucky. They're poised to win all these games, except for that Edmonton game. That's been their only real stinker. And that one still astounds me how bad they were that game. But that's not like the Rough Riders. Everybody's going to have a game like that, I guess, maybe one or two along along the way. Hamilton might have five or six more of those, right, the way they're playing. But the the West is anybody's ball game. Uh the, the Rough Riders are getting okay play. They shake it. They're going to shake up their defense a little bit. It looks like Amari Henderson is out he, with an injury. Deontay Williams goes back in. 
there's some great players on that team. Roland Milligan watching him play, Jameer Thurman. And how about that defensive line? They've patched it together without Anthony Lanier, and these guys are still getting pressure. They're playing exceptionally well, and I think that's the reason why the Rough Riders are at least con- uh, contending in every game that they've been playing that they've been playing in. Yeah, and that I was just going to say they're like obviously you don't want to ever be close. You want to have the victory secured, but these losses are close. They're coming down. They're, they're showing compete. They're showing that competitiveness. And and we can't say that about this team last year. And in a lot of those games where it just looked like they had already mailed it in. So the fact that this is an entertaining team, I think that's what fans wanted. Uh, they compete. They work for each other. They try. They're not perfect. They're going to make mistakes and they're going to face adversity. And, and we're seeing that through the middle part of the season here. And, and, and I, I still go back to the, the Corey Mace effect where, where he's, built this team as a family and, and everybody is buying in it and, and doing the right things and saying the right things. And I think, you know, by the time the playoffs roll around, this team will be in the hunt because of that, because they face this adversity and, and they very well could make noise in the playoffs because of it. Yep. They're a, they're a decent team. You're right. Corey Mace has had a huge effect as head coach. We can also criticize Corey Mace a little bit. Uh, some of the strategies of the last game uh, were a little con- confounding to me especially that one where they were pretending to go for a third short third down gamble kept trevor harris in the in the game even though it's his first game back he never runs a short offense short yardage offense and then trying to get a delay a game or an offside penalty they ended up getting a delay a game penalty moved the ball back brett lother missed the field goal those are little strategic things that uh i think we can expect from a first year head coach but hopefully for the Rough Riders' sake, don't continue, that he gets a little bit smoother on his decision-making. He hasn't had many mess-ups, right? And it is his first year on this, as a head coach, making the and he's making the defensive decisions because he's a defensive coordinator, but he's got to be a little smoother on some of these, and uh, I think that was a bit of a mistake from, uh, from Corey Mason. There might be a few of those along the line, but as they move along, uh, they're all accountable to each other, which is a good thing. They're learning from each other, another good thing. And as you say, Taylor, they're going to be a pretty good team, and they're certainly contenders for the <laughs> the wild, wild west, however it ends up. Yes, no doubt. All right, well, Saskatchewan, uh, of course, is in Toronto on Thursday, so I'm sure there will be lots to dissect from that game again uh, next week on the Rider Rumblings podcast. Daryl, thanks as always for joining. You're welcome, Taylor. Good to see you.